Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am excited to be here with my friend Gail Taylor. She's actually a returning guest on the podcast, and we're going to talk about a few different things than we did last time. Last time we talked a lot about uh, getting a business plan together. She has a finance background, but she has gone fully into the artistic side. Recently, she's explored a lot of cool income streams that we're going to talk about, including Kickstarter. But before we get into that, Gail, why don't you give us a recap? If they didn't listen to our previous episode, episode which was about a year and a half ago, um, you know, what's your background? Uh, what is your, how did you get into music and what made you decide to move more fully into music and speaking in your sixties? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Brie. And thanks for having me back. I'm really honored to be here. This is cool. Um, so what happened was at the age of 58, I decided to take piano lessons and I had been, I was a financial advisor for 25 years and I loved it. I really liked my career, but at the age of 58, I decided to take piano lessons and I had no music background. So I'm like <laughs> learning scales. I'm starting from scratch. And oh my God, I fell in love with it. Music started flooding back into my life. And it was so, it was just amazing. So after two years of piano lessons, <laughs> you can you can imagine, I, I think I was at, in grade three at that point. <laughs> I thought, you know what? I'm loving this so much. I'm already financially independent. I'm going to retire a little sooner than I had planned. And I'm going to study music full time. So at 61, I sold my practice and I started studying music full time. And because of the online world we're in, man, I got to study with Berkeley. I mean, it was amazing. You don't have to audition. <laughs> you just have to pay and you get these amazing programs. So I was studying with Berkeley, a couple of universities locally here that I took courses with private teachers. And after two years, like I was bass guitar lessons, ear training, songwriting. <laughs> yeah, no, I was taking it all. And after two more years, I thought, you know what, I'm going to reinvent myself as a musician. And when I shared that story with people, I kept getting over and over again. That is so inspiring. I'm going to go do some dream they had put on the back burner. And I was hearing this from people I knew. I was hearing it from strangers. I was hearing it so much that I thought, whoa, <laughs> I'm coming out of retirement. I am going to start a business, Gail Taylor Music. I'm going to become a keynote speaker. I had spoke for 20, 30 years in finance. So I'm going to become an inspirational keynote speaker and help folks become their best selves. I'm going to use my music. I'm going to use my personal stories. I'm going to talk about, you know, my, my subjects are empowering women, addiction, and leveling up. And so, so yeah, so that's how the journey started. And that's how I got here. That is so cool. And I mean, really brave, like to, to, to like start a whole new thing, not just like starting a new career, because I have a lot of people in my community that they've done music on the side or they did music when they were younger, they put it to the side for their kids or for their career. And then when they retire, they go back to it. Right. But you started from scratch, like full on scratch at age 58. That is incredible. And I think very brave. And really, like you said, inspiring to people that may have had some kind of a dream, but they thought, well, because I didn't learn when I was a kid, it'll be too hard. I won't be able to do it. It won't come naturally. So hats off to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So 
once you got going with your, you know, music career and the speaking and all that stuff, um, kind of what were you looking to, to do? Were you wanting to like help other, help inspire other musicians as well? Because, you know, your, your talks, like you said, were inspiring women, but it seems like what you also had a heart to do was like get other people to do what you did, which is, you know, kind of go out there on a limb, follow their dream kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And leveling up sort of fits in that category. Mm -hmm. Cause that's one of the things that I found with musicians. Um, I've written a song, my catalog right now has about 13 songs and they've all got lyric videos and they're all inspirational songs, but I found that a lot of folks in the music industry thought if they hit the age 30, then that was it. They were, they had to leave the industry altogether if they hadn't made it and start, you know, something that they, that they didn't really enjoy. And, and yeah, so my, my speeches and are, are designed to say, no, no, stay in the industry that you love and just pivot into how you approach that, um, even from an income standpoint. Like we talked about, um, you and I talked a little bit before the call about all the different ways that you can generate income from music. And there are just so many of them. Yeah. And I think people don't realize how many there are, but they also just might not have the strength to do it. So I'm really happy that you're out there giving them that, that little, little shove, you know, that little push. And I know that you even are writing a book around this. Is that, does that kind of stem out of the talks that you've done and what made you want to put it in book form? Yeah, it does. It actually is an accompaniment to go with the speech. This is the second book I'm going to pen. I, I wrote a book on finance. I used to teach uh, for the University of Alberta for the Faculty of Extension. I taught Introduction to the Financial Markets, and I couldn't find a textbook that I liked that worked for my course, so I wrote one. Mm. And so this was published in the early 2000s. And so, yeah, so this is my second time at this. And, uh, and I had hired an entertainment lawyer when I got into the business and started figuring out where I was going to go. And he was the one that recommended that you should write a book to, to use as, as credibility, to help share your stories with people that aren't going to hear you speak. And so that was sort of where the idea came from. And from there, it's just, uh, continued to grow as you know I did the kickstarter project but the folks I'm still in the middle of it the folks listening to us now this is going to be after the fact but uh, I've hit a hundred percent of my target and uh, and now I'm going on to hey maybe hit a thousand percent <laughs> yeah maybe well I mean back to the book and we'll talk about the kickstarter in a second because I definitely wanted to dive deep into that but you know having written a book myself too, I think you're absolutely right about the credibility. Also, it's something to put on your merch table when you're, you know, when you're there at an event and you're speaking and then people can take it home or give it to somebody that can't be there. My book is up there on the, the shelf there, but I just wanted to kind of bring this up as another income stream for musicians, because I have several people in my community that have written books about you know, different aspects of their career, either like on the inspirational side or something that they have great experience in like songwriting or um, I'm just trying to think, you know, even just like making money as an independent artist. I know some people that have written books on that. So you may think those of you listening that you don't have anything to give as an author what do you say to that, Gail? Like what, what made you think I've got something to say as an author? Yeah. And I think I, I'm, I'm guessing the majority of your listeners have something to say as mm -hmm. an author. Mm -hmm. um, you brought forward that, you know, the, the questioning yourself, you know, do I have something to say? Can I write a book? Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of little online courses. There's a lot of opportunities out there that you can basically, how do I write my first book? Just like you learn, how do I write my first song? It's yep. the same thing, right? And one of the courses that I did take with Berkeley School of Music 
was uh, was business, music business. And they, in the music business part, they said, okay, here's where your income streams come from. And Brie, if I can remember, there was like 24 of them. And writing was one of them, writing, your, mm. writing a book with your stories, talk about what inspired your song. The way that I'm going to do it is each chapter is going to have a personal story and something that was challenging maybe in my life and the tools that I learned how to do use through personal growth. And then it'll have a little QR code to a song that I wrote mm. that was inspired by that story. And so, so yeah, that's, um, but, but I think for, for the listeners, when you're trying to decide what out of all those different options of, of revenue, should I go, which, which, which direction should I go? Find the one you like, find the one that you're passionate about. If you like being on stage and you like speaking, then do the, you know, the keynote concert, the keynote speaking, um, you can do the writing, you can do uh, the Kickstarter, you could do, of course, you know, the royalties, um, the merchandise, there's just so many of them. I love that idea of with the song and the QR code, That's almost like an expanded liner notes, right? Into a book. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. And, and yeah. everyone here can can identify with liner notes. And a lot of times we wanna say so much, right? About the songs that we've written, but we feel like we can't, put like we can't afford to like make a big booklet that goes with our album especially if we feel like nobody's buying the album right because they're all listening to streaming so maybe instead what they do is they buy the book and then they use the qr code and go to our website and listen to our music that way i yes, love exactly. that idea <laughs> exactly because remember liner notes like when i started listening to music and rock was the you know set in the 70s and and the 80s i mean we did albums and there was like three or four page booklets in those albums the liner notes were were quite extensive and an exciting part of the music journey yep yeah no it's it's like getting a book with your with your album right yeah. so i think that's a great way to go Okay. So let's talk about the Kickstarter. So did you, you're doing the Kickstarter specifically to help pay for you writing the book? Is that, is that how it came together? Yeah. So the way that Kickstarter works is that the, the intent is pick a project and then you set yourself up on the Kickstarter site to fund the project. So, so I had to pick a project so what my project was, was to raise the funds to write my book and to go on the speaking circuit for one year. Mm. And it was very similar. There was another musician, Amanda, I think her name was, she did a keynote and ended up with like over a million dollars. And she, her, the way she worded it was, I'd like to raise the funds to write my album and to go on tour for a year. Mm. So I kind of modeled it, right? Write my book, go on the speaking circuit for a year. So then once you get once you get your project up and designed, then you you raise the funds and you offer rewards. So they're giving you pledges, you're giving them rewards. So you can pledge as little as $10 on mine and the reward is you're pre-ordering the digital copy of my book. You could pledge twenty five hundred, and it's a thousand dollars off the price for one of my keynote speeches for a concert for a conference. Ah, oh, that's interesting. So you're basically pre-selling your exactly. appearances on your speaking tour. Exactly. That's exactly what you're doing. You're booking up yourself for the next year, the next eighteen months, whatever time frame that you're doing it. My merch is inspirational pendants that I use to say, you know, if you're in your head and having negative thoughts, rub your pendant and get out of your head. That's one of the rewards. If you do $35, you get a pendant. So yeah, exactly. It's, it's me bringing my business uh, to light through Kickstarter. Love it. So why did you choose Kickstarter. I know that Kickstarter, one of the things that scares musicians about Kickstarter is that if you don't make your goal, you lose your funds. Right. So why yeah. did you decide to take that risk? 
Okay. So what happened was uh, when I did take that course at Berkeley on, on music, uh, the, the business, the business of music, that was one of the things, one of our assignments was to write up a crowdfunding project. And so I said to the professor, I said, my project, I want it to be real. This isn't just an assignment for this course. At some point in the future, I go on live. And so he read it, gave me some ideas that were should be different than what I did and said, you know, he recommended that I use Kickstarter as opposed to uh, Indigo or, uh, or some of the other platforms. And so... So then when I continued to do my work and my research about it, here's what I found out is that, and here's the good thing for your listeners to know about the amount, is that first of all, you're going to reach your target by friends and family and colleagues, right? So when you, when you pick your amount, whether you make it 2,500 or 5,000, I made mine $10,000. So when you pick your amount, you have to be pretty comfortable with that amount that your friends and your family and your fans and your colleagues will support you for that end. And then you have to market it before it goes live because really, and I hired a consultant for a one hour session and learned this, is that if you want the algorithm to pick you up and you want your yourself to trend, then you have to pretty much reach your target in the first 24 hours. Ooh. So whatever your goal is, you're pre-selling. Like I was, I was phoning my friends and my family <laughs> and, and everybody that I knew from back in my university <laughs> and, and asking them, okay, will you pledge and how much? So before I went live, I knew how much I already had in the camp. Mm. And so what happened for me was in the first 24 to 48 hours, I got 7,500 of the 10,000. And that was enough for the algorithm to pick me up for Kickstarter to look at my project and come back and say, this is one of the projects that we love. So congratulations, we've picked you up as a project we love. We'll give you all the marketing material saying that, we, that we've given you this designation and we'll also share you across our platform. So now there could be some momentum from strangers. I didn't get a lot of the momentum at that point. Um, and I still continued to work through social media and friends and family and ended up hitting my target. And I'm doing a lot of podcasts and some of them are being aired before the Kickstarter ends. So you know, fingers crossed that it'll hit a higher amount. But yeah, that's a really important thing for folks to know that if they want to, if they want to use Kickstarter and they want to um, hit that target, make sure that they have enough people in their life that are going to help start them in order to get the momentum to get the strangers. Yeah, I think that is really important because a lot of musicians tend to think that Kickstarter is about reaching new strangers. And it might be <laughs> eventually, but like you said, you've got to have, you've got to know that most of your money is going to come from family and friends and people that know your family, you or family, your family and friends right? You know, people that knew me as a kid or whatever, you know, that are now in their 70s or 80s, and they have a little extra money that they could throw my way. You know, that would be the people that I would expect to give, not someone who hasn't met me yet, or someone that just follows me on social media. And knowing that you're supposed to do all that work before you even open the Kickstarter is so important. That is such a great piece of advice that you just gave. Oh yeah, that pre pre time, that pre campaign, and you can go on Kickstarter and you can set it all up, and you can put all your pledging amounts and get your videos going, and and make your date to go live thirty days from then. Mm. So that you still have the material to market with. Hey, my pre launch here it is, and you get and and do it, and you'd be surprised, like you said, 
yeah, maybe your social media followers aren't going to contribute, but I had folks contributing that I hadn't talked to in 20 years, like you just said. But if you can show that there's enough folks out there that believe in you and and this journey that you're on, then you've got the chance of getting a little bit of momentum. Yeah, I think that is so key that people generally they want to be on a winning team. You know, they want to they want to they're not going to be the first person to go out there and say, OK, I'll give when they don't see that other people are giving. That's why you have to get your family and friends on board. But when they see that, like, you know, it's going well and it's going to probably materialize into a project, then they're going to be more will willing to give. Yeah. And I also noticed all the analytics going up across the board, right? Since I'm doing Kickstarter, more people are listening to my music on Spotify and on YouTube and checking out my website. And so it does create that traffic. I once had somebody say to me, crowdfunding's okay if you have a crowd. <laughs> Right. So you have yep. to have an idea that there's folks out there that uh, that believe in you. That's right. It's it's not gather a crowd funding. It's take the crowd you already have and yep. get them to fund it. Yeah. And you'd be surprised at how how much people like to step up and help you. Another thing I'll share with you Brie, about Kickstarter is that this is something else that I learned from the homework that I did on how to do it. And that's that the video that you open your Kickstarter with, when people go on your Kickstarter, the first thing they do is click on a video of you telling your story and why you're doing the Kickstarter and what you're all about. And that video is everything. Mm. Yeah. And, and so do you put your music in the video or is it just, is it just talking? I, I it's mostly talking, but I do have I'm playing in the back, background. Okay. Yeah, I had a conversation with an artist once who approached me about their Kickstarter, and I was like, "Okay, you know, I appreciate your story, but I don't hear any music in this video. Like, I don't have any idea what your music is like. This is someone I didn't even know." And they said, well, I'm getting, making my Kickstarter to create my music. And I'm like, but we at least have to have some sense of what your music is like in order for people to invest in you, you know, beyond your family and friends that might know you. Here I am, somebody that doesn't know you. You're approaching me and I have no idea what kind of music you make or if, I, if you know, I would just want to at least feel like it was something that I would want to support. Right. Yeah, and that yeah, just seemed really strange to me. I get what she's saying. Like I'm raising the money to make my album, but at least like, you know, put an acoustic recording of yourself or a live recording or something so people can get a sense. A demo or something. Yeah, yeah. Not a bad idea. I actually put two of my songs. So you have that one video when you first go on the site that tells you about the project and the story. And that video is basically to for any Kickstarter backers to decide whether they want to look further into this page. Mm -hmm. And so as you go down my page and I give a little excerpt from the intro of my book, and then you scroll down a little more, and then there's the, the two of my songs and the video link to go listen to my songs uh, on YouTube and to watch the video. So yeah, I'm with you putting as much in there so that they can really get to see what you're all about and what your music's all about is important. Yeah, definitely. Now, is, is there anything else that you wanted to share with people about Kickstarter as you were going through it that you learned or, you know, that you think musicians need to know? I think the biggest thing that, and we kind of touched on it already, is that if you want the algorithm to pick you up, the more people that you can get backing you, the better. Like for me, my challenge is the amount of people. I, I generated my $10,000 and 46 people mm -hmm. did that, right? I think if you could have 2,000 people give you the $10,000, you would have a better chance of the algorithm continuing to uh, show you front and center more often. 
So I think like I, 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 I'm always saying on these podcasts that are, are coming out before the Kickstarter's over, hey, if my story resonates with you, go on my Kickstarter and just pledge $10 and pre-order the book. Right. And that's that, you know, the more people I could get to do the ten dollars and pre-order the book, the better chance that I have of the momentum that that the site's looking for. So so that's what I think is key. And and yeah, do your homework. Make sure that you're I mean, this I mean, I basically shared with you everything I did. I did in my homework. So I don't know how much more there is, but but yeah, make sure that you're prepared. And that you have the time to work with it. Like I sent out a lot of emails to raise that 10,000 and those 46 people. I sent out hundreds of emails. My mailing list, you know, once a week, I was posting all the time. I was doing crazy TikToks, rapping about my video. <laughs> I saw some of those. I loved it. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a campaign and it's going to consume a lot of your time while it's live. I think the other thing is that they say 30 days is the perfect amount of time. I did mine for 45. And all I can say is, phew, thank God I did it for 45. Because it took me the first two weeks just to figure out what the heck was going on. Mm -hmm. Right. So I didn't that 30 day, the, the fact that I had 45 days gave me the opportunity to continue to to work on getting the momentum and you don't stop at a hundred percent. There's people that, you know, if you look at these projects, there's people that go after 10,000 and get 200,000 mm. or, or go after 35,000 and get a million. I mean, that was what I was hoping. I was hoping that I could get the momentum to push me into that hundred thousand, the 200,000 area um, with other people that would resonate outside of my family and friends and I'm still optimistic yeah <laughs> if you're listening to this right now you can probably go check and see how I did because it'll be <laughs> over <laughs> fingers crossed but the nice thing is that you do this kickstarter and like one of the things that they can get like you said ten dollars they can pre-order your book right well when the kickstarter is over they can still pre-order your book right yeah. so are you able to like then kind of turn your marketing from the Kickstarter to getting people to pre-order your book as it's coming out in the spring? Absolutely. Absolutely. There is no doubt that the momentum that I was able to get and the campaign that I'm on. So now it'll be, I'll be sending people to my website, right? So it's like Gail Taylor music. That's it. Mm -hmm. www.gailtaylormusic. <laughs> And so, yeah, and then I'll have a place in my store where I sell my pendants and my uh, my keynote speeches. Oh, yeah. And custom songs. That was another one that Berkeley brought forward to to make money as a musician was custom songs. And I've been doing those, too. And so, yeah, I just I just found the areas that resonated with me. Yeah, no, actually, I've seen several artists put custom songs into their Kickstarter as like a high level reward. I did too. Yeah. It's, it's fun. I mean, especially if they can, you know, get a custom song for like a big anniversary or a birthday or something like that, you know? Yeah, exactly. And again, I dropped a thousand bucks off my price mm. and, oh, so, you know, it's a, it's a good deal for, for the, the Kickstarter folks too. Right. Right. So, okay. So let's, let's kind of pivot. This all really comes together. Like, I love that you're kind of melding all these income streams of the music, the custom songs, the speaking and the writing, it all fits together so well. Um, so as far as the keynote concerts that you do, like, how hard was it for you to come up with, you've got three programs, right? That's pretty amazing. And I know for me, when I was doing this type of thing, I had my one signature program that was like about my life, but then I had kind of ones that went for different holidays. I had a Christmas one, I had a patriotic one, you know, that kind of thing. How hard was it for you to come up with these programs? Because I think sometimes musicians are very intimidated by the idea of coming up with a program versus just, you know, getting up there and singing some songs. 
So, yeah. So I think it was similar to yours when you talked about you had this, the core one with the personal stories. Mm -hmm. The only difference is I broke the personal stories into three categories. And so the ones that I share with one group of people, I have a, I have a number of different stories. And so I might share one of them across the board. I might share one of them with this group only. So, so it is about personal stories. Now, for me, because I'm not a live musician, I actually use uh, my 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 videos and my songs on YouTube, or I download them onto the computer and they throw them up on the on the big screen. So I don't play live music on mm. the event. I'm not that talented. <laughs> I mean, I did with me starting later in life. I did get pretty good. In fact, I'm playing on a lot of my songs that I recorded the last uh, EP that I did that I recorded in Nashville. I'm playing the keyboards on it, but it's studio, right? right. I played them in the studio. And then they, uh, in some cases I had my, uh, I had the, the, the speed of the song faster than I could play. So I would play it at, at one BPM and then they'd speed it up and and I know it's so creative. I love this world of technology. <laughs> and so and so in my videos, I'm on there, you know, live. But you know, it's like the lip singer. I'm only pretending to play my guitar. <laughs> and but so I love this. This is encouraging to musicians. So many people come to me and they say, "I can't play live. Like I don't play an instrument well enough to accompany myself." And, you know, maybe they're too, in, a lot of times they're too embarrassed to use tracks, which I don't have a problem with using tracks. You right. know, if you, if you've got a good system and you've got good sounding tracks, like there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but you're even one step beyond that. You're not even singing live, right? But you've got, you've created these videos that are like interactive for the audience and they're seeing you up there and then they're seeing you live as you speak. I love that you've combined that and you've, you know, you've kind of found a way around any limitations that you have. And the other thing, too, as a speaker is that you got to be careful because there's a lot of a lot of gigs that you can book that they aren't conducive to live music. Mm. Right. They don't have like to the the uh, the wherewithal, like when they pull you up on stage, especially if it's a big group, when they pull you up on stage, you got like 45 minutes. There's no setting up. There's no tearing down. There's no hooking into a mixer. <laughs> like you're just getting up there doing your speech and getting down. And so to use the big screen and to share your music that way, um, it it does work when you're when you're speaking and I can get them all up dancing. Right. I can get them out of their comfort zones. I can get that dopamine <laughs> happening without being uh, being able to do the live musician thing. No, that's really smart. I mean, I did a conference center in Wisconsin this uh, June and I couldn't I was flying. I didn't bring any instruments. They didn't have a keyboard and I was like going to use, you know, tracks, but then they didn't even have like a real, a speaker, and, you know, I had to hook it into like this tiny little thing that hooked the, to their computer system that was, you know, in the, in the main speakers. And it's like, whatever the hotel has, right. Yeah. You're, you're working around people that are not thinking like musicians. They don't realize, oh, that you might need a microphone. That's not, you know, uh, just a, like a mic that's just there for the speaker only right? Because that's not going to sound very good when you sing. So just having ways to work around that is really, really smart. And it makes you very mobile. Yes. Yeah, it does. It does. And it allows you to go for that income stream, even if you're not a live musician, right? Because we know that touring is important right now for live musicians, because there's no sales of CDs, albums. So they pretty, pretty much have to sell their merch and and get their uh, their fans from touring. So if you're not a touring musician, well, you could go on the speaking circuit. If 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 yeah, 
if you have the gift of the gab, <laughs> I always say that songwriting ended up being my superpower. And the reason I think that is, is because I talk so much <laughs> and songs are just stories turned into lyrics. That's right. I mean, I don't even know that you have to have absolutely the gift of the gab. You just have to be able to tell a story in a compelling way. And all of you guys already do that through songwriting, yeah. right? You just need to learn a different way of telling that story. Oh, yeah. And that's a perfect, perfect analogy because I'm going from the storyteller because I spoke in the finance world for 30 years. I'm going from the storyteller to the songwriter for them to go from the songwriter to the storyteller. Same thing, same thing, just in reverse. That's right. That's right. Well, man, this has been so inspiring, Gail. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom around the Kickstarter, around writing a book. Um, is there any last thing you want to say, especially to those that may be later in their career and just not quite sure if they could make the music thing happen? Yeah, I say go for it and go for the components of it that you really like, that you're passionate about. If you're enjoying it, then it's the journey right? It's the journey. To me, it's the journey that matters. And yes, we can, we can uh, want to go. We could, we, like I say, we're here now, here's where we want to be, right? So we all know that's the gap, right? What's in between there's the gap. And what do you have to do in order to get to your goal? Well, that gap is the journey and that's the part you have to enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, let them know how can they get your book? Cause I know their, your book will also be super inspiring to them. Okay. So, so yeah, so pre-order it. On, uh, so Gail Taylor music. So Gail is G A I L. And then Taylor is, I think there's only one real way to, unless you so <laughs> close, right? T A Y L O R. So Gail Taylor music.com. <laughs> That's my website. And you'll be able to pre-order it. As soon as the Kickstarter closes, the store will have the pre-order op option in there. Awesome. And what's the title of your book? Curveballs. Curveballs. Right. Because the, I love that title. The cur you know, I say life's going to throw curveballs at you, folks. It's 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 that's the reality of living. You get curveballs and it's not the curveballs that matter. It's how you handle them. It's how yes. you deal with them. That's the part that that is going to set you apart from the other folks. Absolutely. And if they would like to follow you on social media and see your fun reels and TikToks, which I've been enjoying, how can they follow you? Everywhere. It's Gail Taylor Music on Instagram, Gail Taylor Music on Facebook, Gail Taylor on TikTok. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn too. If you folks are on LinkedIn, you can find me there. She's everywhere. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gail, for all of your wisdom today and just sharing your excitement around becoming a musician with all of our listeners. Oh, thank you, Bree. <laughs> thank you for letting me be here. I'm honored. I, I said that at the beginning and yeah, I'm really, uh, I'm really happy that I was able to share this time with you. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.